Romans 7, 11 through 25 says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. If you're listening on today, I need you to drop in the chat these words. Please excuse my attitude. In the words of Scarface, sorry if I'm being rude, but I've got something to say to you, hoping you won't lose your cool. Today, I've come to talk to some people with some attitude. Uh huh. You feel like, yeah, I'm acting a little funny, but I don't mean to be funny. Yeah, I was rude, but I didn't mean to be rude. I didn't really want to be, but it came out anyway. I don't mean to look at you funny, even though I did it. I don't mean it, but I do mean it. I'm sorry if I didn't speak. If I rolled my eyes, don't take it personal. If I cuss, forgive me. I meant to, but I didn't mean to. You see, I've got a war raging on the inside of me right now. I've got an attitude and it's got me feeling some type of way. It's not you. I got headaches that I can't explain. I'm feeling sick to my stomach, but I'm not pregnant. I'm happy one minute and crying the next. I'm smiling one minute and angry the next. I want to speak kindly, but can't help but cuss. My chest is hurting, but my heart is fine. You gotta forgive me, because what's going on in me spiritually is beginning to manifest physically, and it's reflecting in my attitude. And I know you just want to help, but it's hard for me to allow you to help when I can't completely and confidently grasp what's going on in me myself. So I got an attitude. Uh huh. And I want to ask how many of you can identify, because I don't want you to perjure yourself. But if I have any real people in the chat who don't mind being a little transparent, who will be real and admit that on the inside, I've got an attitude. If this is you, just put the lifted hand emoji in the chat and let me help you, because I've been on both sides of the track. I've been so consumed with myself and what I was dealing with that it was hard to listen to someone who was trying to help. But then I've been on the other side, trying aimlessly to help some folk who didn't want to listen to sound advice. And it's hard, frustrating, and devastating when you're dealing with the people who you love but cannot compassionately help because they're stuck on stupid, missing exit after exit off Fool's Freeway. It can be a hard thing when you have to sit back and watch someone you love toiling and going through when you can see what's ahead but they're so consumed with the I mentality. They are so wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in the theology of me that while you're shouting at them danger ahead, they keep moving in the direction of what's going to eventually destroy them. There's a story of a boyfriend and girlfriend 
who had gone to Florida and off the coast decided to go for a swim in the ocean. The boyfriend was trying to beckon the girlfriend further into the water, but she didn't want to go for fear of not only the deep water, but also of what was in the deep water. And suddenly, without notice, as he was beckoning her further, a dorsal fin appears and as he's swimming out, the fin is swimming in and headed right towards him. Him being so consumed with what he wanted to do and enjoying what he was doing could not hear his girlfriend screaming at him, come back, come back. And before she knew it, her boyfriend disappeared under the water and blood began to bubble to the top of the surface. And how many times have we had someone in our lives yelling at us, turn around, come back, danger ahead. But we were so caught up and consumed with the theology of me that we kept heading in the same direction. Not understanding that the person behind us can see further than we can. Because it's easier to see when you're on the outside looking in than it is to see when you're on the inside looking out. And you don't want to listen because you know the person's story who's yelling at you. Uh huh. The person yelling is in the same water you're in. So you can't possibly be in danger if they're in the same place that you are. But maybe I'm trying to help you because even though I'm not where I need to be, I've been in that story and I know how that story ends. Be careful the people you refuse to hear because you know their struggle. Because even in the midst of their struggle, they may possess the tools needed to get you out. Be careful because just maybe them being in what they're in is giving them the insight into you and they're trying to keep you from ending up where they are. Sometimes it's better to just do what I say and not what I do. Because if you keep doing what I'm doing, you may end up worse off than I am. And I'm trying to save you the devastation of something you can't get out of. Uh -huh. Pam Greer, Miss Foxy Brown, gives a story about how she had to exit a relationship with Richard Pryor because of his addiction to cocaine. And because she wanted more for him than he wanted for himself, she said his addiction was taking them both down. Well, Pam says his addiction was rooted within something in his past that was messing with his present. And I'm here to encourage you that if you do not resolve and deal with the demons from your past, your past will ruin your present and erase your future. She said cocaine had become his anesthetic for dealing with the pain from the past. And that addiction was not only taking him down, but taking her down in the present. Be careful who you attach to while they're going down. Because if you're not careful, if you haven't been anointed to see them through that season, I don't care how saved you are. I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care how long you've been in church. It's hard to save someone who's drowning because they will pull down anyone close to them to keep them from going under. And only a person trained for that particular season and episode will be able to reach out and stay afloat in the midst of a sinking person fighting. That's a lifeguard's job. What am I saying? If you see me drowning and you are not a lifeguard, you're not someone anointed to help keep me from drowning. Exit stage left because it's a season of my life where I need help. You need assurance. You need safety. Not someone who just wants a moment. Someone who's just trying to make a name for themselves on top of my pain. I'm sorry. Please excuse my attitude. Because too many people are broken, hurt, and distraught because individuals came into their lives claiming to want to help and they ended up like the woman with the issue of blood. They made them worse. Be very careful that in the midst of you trying to save someone else, you don't die in the process. I see that one didn't help you. Marvin Gaye, with all that he had going on for him, made pain-based decisions. Because with all of his giftedness in his past, he had a complicated relationship with his daddy. You see, his daddy was a preacher and a cross-dresser. And then he was graped by a male relative. He received conflicted signals and spent the rest of his life dealing with the cross-dressing father and being graped. He got in relationships willing to do anything and everything he could 
trying to prove his manhood. Brothers, your manhood should never be established by how you successfully satisfy your appetite. A song said it's the dog in you. <laughs> but let's deal with dogs for a minute, because dogs, before they get it on, have sense enough to sniff each other. Uh-huh. They sniff each other as to say, I want to know where you've been before me. Where were you at last night? What you been with? I'm not getting with you and you're not getting with me till I know where you've been and who you was with. Because ladies, when a man has been with you, he leaves behind a scent. That's why no matter how much you wash, it does no good because the scent isn't on you. The scent is is in you that's why when he leaves he comes back sniffing around because he's marked his territory with his scent and the problem with many of us is that when god really sends the man who we are meant to be with he can attach to us because when he sniffs he gets a whiff of the scent of everyone else who's been there before and i have a question for you what do you smell like on the inside what pheromones are you sending out because if you keep drawing to you dogs it's because you're sending out a scent that dogs are responding to all men are not dogs you are the common denominator for the dogs you're getting which means that something in you is attracting dogs and if you're tired of dogs then stop serving kibbles and you'll stop getting bits I heard Smokey Robinson say that the problem with Marvin was that everybody loved Marvin, but Marvin didn't love Marvin. And if you're not careful, no matter who else loves you, if you never learn to love yourself, you will limit treating yourself in accordance to the minimization of how you feel about yourself instead of the maximization of how God feels about yourself. Uh -huh. And just like the boyfriend, Richard Pryor and Marvin Gaye, when you live and operate in the atmosphere of the theology of me, myself, and I, you will constantly make pain-based decisions, forcing others to watch your demise or pull them down with you in the process. When you have people that you desire to help in the midst of you wanting more for them, they really don't know how to help you help them or help themselves because they're just like the man in the tomb crying and cutting themselves cutting themselves and crying crying because they're hurting cutting themselves in order to nullify the torment going on on the inside crying because they feel alone crying because they feel isolated crying because life is lifing cutting themselves with sex Cutting themselves with alcohol. Cutting themselves with drugs. Cutting themselves with bad behavior. Because there's a war raging on the inside of them. And maybe since people can't hear my cries, if they see my blood, they'll come running to the rescue. Crying because what I want to do is waging war against what I know to do. And I don't know how to fight spiritually, so I'm fighting physically. So please... Excuse my attitude, uh-huh. Oh baby, you're not by yourself. It's a whole lot of attitudes in the world today. Everybody ain't gonna admit it, but that's why church folk can't get along. Too many attitudes in the atmosphere. Everybody wants to be a leader, but no one wants to sit down, shut up, and be a follower. Too much me, myself, and I floating around. And the real reason it's hard for me to deal with you it's because if the truth be told, the same war raging on the inside of you is raging on the inside of me. And it's hard for me to deal with you because when I see you, you are a reflection of what's going on in me. Uh-huh. Because just like the boyfriend and girlfriend, even though the shark got him in the water, I'm still in the same water. And now God is telling me to go further, but I'm paralyzed with fear because I saw what happened to him in the water. I know what's out there so I'm afraid to move forward into what God has for me because I'm so focused on me and the fear that's crippling me that I can't rush out to help someone else that I see in trouble because what I don't want to do in the midst of what I should do has a hold on me. So now I gotta be honest with you. I got an attitude too. 
and I'm almost out your way. But here we have Paul speaking and Paul is saying, I find here that I have a dilemma. He asked a question according to the Message Bible. Does that mean I can't even trust what is good? That is the law. Is good just as dangerous as evil? No again, sin simply did what sin is so famous for doing using the good as a cover to tempt me to do what would finally destroy me. The Bible says in Proverbs 14 and 12, There is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That one might not have worked for you, so let me pick another one. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. It might be lawful for you to drink, but how does it benefit you when you need to drive afterwards? Uh huh. It might be lawful for you to cuss someone out, but how does it benefit you when that might be the person with the key to take you from where you are to where you need to be? It's lawful for you to have sex, but how does it benefit you when you're left with nothing but a wet tail, a wet Pekka, an STD, raising babies on your own, wondering why he isn't calling. How does it benefit the kingdom when what you are doing doesn't edify God, even though it's lawful for you to do it? Paul says, sin does what sin is known to do. It hides amongst what seems good to tempt you into what will inevitably destroy you. Because eventually one drink will turn into two. Eventually the chaser will disappear. Eventually the blunt will become your only sedative. Eventually the pain will turn into anger, into rage. Eventually the rage will make you act upon it. Eventually sin will do what sin was designed to do, which is bring death. And how often has the eye in sin caused us to take our eye off God? How often has the retribution of sin accomplished its goal and left us desolate with nothing but me, myself, and I, and no God? How often? Paul said, what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. I've begun to do the very thing I know I hate. And I keep telling myself, this year is going to be different. This time is going to be different. I know that insanity is doing the same thing but expecting a different result. So I've made up my mind that come hell or high water, I won't go down that same road. So I'm making a declaration that this time I'm going to go home another way. But just when I get ready to turn. Something catches my eye and causes me to take pause. You see, in my mind, I know I don't need what I see, but something deep down on the inside wants what I see, and something begins to tell me that I gotta have what I see. And now I have to satisfy the if factor. What will happen if? Oh, many of us have fallen prey to the enemy because of the if factor. <laughs> Y'all gonna be quiet? That's okay. Some of us have married our if factors, knowing it wasn't good for us. Some of us got distracted by lips, hips, and fingertips, that big butt and a smile, and didn't notice the itch she had under those jeans. Some of y'all have been distracted by how smooth he was with his tongue, and didn't notice the temper or how quick he was with his fist. We've made a declaration that we're going a different way, but then suddenly out of our peripheral, we notice the sight of something we knew we shouldn't have, but our flesh told us we can't be without it. And I've been down this road before. I know this road leaves me trapped in Heartbreak Hotel, but I gotta have it because even though I don't need it, I'm familiar with it. And it's easy for me to deal with and stay in what I'm familiar with. And I know familiarity breeds contempt. And even though I've decided to go after what I should love, I find myself drawn to what I hate. Cause even though I get it and it's good, I hate how I feel afterwards. Cause I loved what I got when I laid down, but hated how I felt when I got up. Cause I chose to settle for what I knew would leave me miserable. I'm torn on the inside. I'm warring on the inside. I'm crying on the inside right now. So please 
Excuse my attitude. So Paul then says, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So as to say, if I can't be trusted to do what is right and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's law is necessary. And at some point, you have to make a decision to let go of what you consider a necessity for what you know is absolutely unequivocally, without a doubt, necessary. You made having a man a necessity when God is saying, I'm all that's necessary. You made drugs a necessity and God is saying, I'm all that's necessary. You made fulfilling the lust of your flesh a necessity when God is saying, everything that I've placed in your spirit is all that is necessary. I've got to get to a place where I relinquish my necessities for what God has told me is necessary. So now I'm confused because I'm standing outside of myself battling myself because it's not that I want to do it but the sin that is in me is so alive that I have no other choice. I've let this thing in me live and grow so much so that I know I'm David Banner but this Hulk on the inside of me is stronger and the minute the wrong button is pushed instead of who I am standing up What's prevalent in me reels its ugly head and tears up everything around me. And when the feeling subsides, once again, I'm left with me, myself, and I. And the turmoil and havoc that it wreaked in my life when I let it run rampant. It's become a law for me or a rule of action of my being. It happens so frequently that it's become predictable that when I would do good because it's so alive within me, sin is always right there to trip me up. You gotta forgive me because my fight is that I want to do good. I delight in doing good, but I'm recognizing that all of me doesn't share in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel and just when I least expect it, They take charge and I need something more. I'm never satisfied. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. (laughs) Let's talk about it. Paul says, I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad. But then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions, but my actions reflect something that I decided against. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. I'm toiling now and wrestling with myself, so please excuse my attitude, cause I've tried everything and nothing helps. And now I'm at the end of my rope. Cause when you're trying, the enemy has a way of throwing in your face the old you with hopes that you would relapse. So Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Is there anybody who can do anything to help me? I've tried men, that didn't work. I've tried women, that didn't work. Tried drugs and alcohol, that didn't help. You tried sex, that didn't help. Who can deliver you? from this body of death. This thing attached to me that is killing me from the inside out. Who can deliver me? I recognize that I can't do it on my own, but I'm lost. I'm angry. I got an attitude by myself, with myself, over myself, because I'm standing face to face with myself, fighting myself, and you're just feeling the effects of my fight. (laughs) Am I talking to anyone here today? You're saying, I'm sorry. It's nothing against you. I'm trying to push you away because I don't know what to do with me. And if I don't know what to do with me, then I definitely don't know what to do with you. So instead of reaching out to you, I'm angry with you. But I'm really not angry with you. I'm angry with myself. Uh huh. Even though you're reaching out and I want to grab hold your hand. There's something inside of me pulling me back. This thing in me is trying to isolate me from all help. It wants to keep me trapped in its prison. And I don't know what to do. So who can deliver me from what's killing me? But then Paul answers his own question. Because when it's in you, it has no choice but to come out of you. He says, I 
thank God through Jesus. Because when you can't find it on the outside, you've got to pull on the inside. Look to the hills from whence cometh your help. Because all your help comes from God. God, who in the vicissitudes of eternity neither came, nor was born, nor was spoken or formed, who was, is, and will be, who took nothing and created something, who spoke and life, light, seasons, and creatures came into existence, told Moses on the side of the mountain, I am that I am, because I didn't do anything to get here, I just am. And I can't be compared to, overthrown by, or stand face to face with another. Matter of fact, I am so much myself that when I decided to make man, I split myself into three and conferred and conversed with myself and told my word whatever I think you speak. Told my breath to move on my word and my word said let us make man and my breath breathe into him and man became a living being and I stood back and said it is very good. He could have stopped right there and just said I am because no matter what you're facing I am. Your problem will fade but I am. The next word he used is that. So not only I am but I am that. If you need a healer, I am that. If you need a comforter, I am that. If you need a banner, I am that. If you need a protector, I am that. Then he continues and says, not only I am, not only I am that, but I am that I am. Literally what he was saying is I'm just me. <laughs> if the people ask you how you made it out, tell them it's just me being me. How you keep your bills paid with no money in your pocket? Tell them it's just God being God. How were you able to continue to fight? It's because God stepped in and said, Daughter, I see what you're going through. I see your fight. But I want you to know that it's a fixed fight. Uh huh. Every now and then, I watched a TV show called World Wrestling Entertainment. It used to be called World Wrestling Federation. But what they had to admit was that the fights were fixed. So they had to change their names. So while you were yelling because your favorite wrestler was winning, what you had to understand was the reason they were winning was because someone in power had fixed the fight and already decided who would win. No matter how they were knocked down, the fight was fixed. No matter how many punches they took, the fight was fixed. You would see them on the ground, pinned under the enemy's hold, and the ref would begin to count. One, the fighter wouldn't get up. Two, the fighter don't get up. But somewhere before three, a leg and an arm comes up and the count was over. And all I'm trying to tell you, in the midst of your attitude, is that the enemy counted you out. The enemy thought he had you down. He counted one but it activated the father. He counted two, that activated the son. But before he got to three, the Holy Ghost stepped in, and ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And somewhere down on the inside, power began to raise up. Power began to stand up. And that power ignited on the inside. Your leg went up, your arm went up, then you got up. All I'm trying to tell you, is yes you're in a battle but the fight is fixed yes you're in a war but the fight is fixed you feel like giving up but don't die now don't give up now don't throw in the towel god is going to turn it around but wait a minute because i didn't give you the whole story of the boyfriend and the girlfriend the truth is the way we got the story is because they were on TV giving an interview. The girlfriend continued. She said she was afraid to go out. She saw the shark. She saw the blood. But she knew in the midst of the blood was someone she loved. Then the shark came back to the surface with her man in its mouth. She said she swam out and began to hit the shark over and over again in the eye. Because in her mind, she said you may have him but you can't keep him. She hit him over and over again, 
until eventually the shark let him go. She said, I couldn't let him have my man. He's too important to me. And I'm here to tell you, you've got to get bold enough that you look past the situation and you tell the enemy, you can't have me no more. You got to let me go. I'm tired of this attitude. I'm calling foul on the play. Matter of fact, you got to relinquish everything attached to me. You can't have my brother. You can't have my sister. You can't have my children. You can't have my mama. You can't have my daddy. Let go of my husband. You may have him now, but you got to let him go. Sometimes you got to do like Moses and tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Even though I'm scared, even though I see danger, I'm doing like this girl and I'm marching into the enemy's camp and taking back what he stole. Champagne gang, tag someone else in the chat and tell them, you're not by yourself. I'm fighting for you. We're in this together. See, that's why I created this space so you could have a community fighting by your side. And if you don't have anyone physically fighting for you, you got someone virtually. I see the tears. I feel the disappointment, but I'm fighting for you. I see the war going on and people have nowhere to turn, but I'm fighting for you. I see the attitudes because that's all you have left to fight with, but I'm fighting for you. Every bit of wisdom, every bit of empowerment is me fighting for you. But are you willing to start fighting for yourself? Are you willing to rise? Take up your bed and walk. Are you ready to step into your destiny? Because I can help you fight, but you've got to put on the gloves. When you start to view yourself as victorious, victory will call unto victory and a champion will be born.